Welcome everyone to our uh, Zoom webinar. My name is Beth Clapper and I am the current president of the board of directors for our Jewish Federation here in Indianapolis. And I'd like to really extend uh, a warm welcome to everyone. Um, this, uh, just a few housekeeping items. This is a uh, Zoom webinar that you all are muted on and, but we want it to be um, interactive. So please, you can type questions um, into your lower right-hand corner of, your, of the screen, and we will field your calls or, or questions during um, the uh, question and answer period later on. Um, so first off, I just wanna wish everyone a happy Monday, and on behalf of our Federation officers and board of directors, our lay leaders, and especially our hardworking staff, um, we want to thank you for being here tonight. I'm sorry, that is my dog in the background. <laughs> my apologies. Um, so, thank you again for all for being here. And um, I would now like to um, introduce Debbie Grant, who is our Executive Vice President and CEO of Federation. And Debbie's going to share with you all some um, things that we have been working on here at Federation. Debbie? Thanks, Beth. Um, so first of all, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I, I wanted to um, just give a quick catch up on the amazing work that is going on in the Jewish community on behalf of, of all of you and, and all of us who are a part of this Jewish community. Um, we have a new page on our website called Connect with Purpose. Um, on that page, you can see all sorts of virtual opportunities to learn together, to um, come together with uh, people of, with like interests. Um, it is our way to help the community engage, um, to share things with your family, to share some of the highlights that are going on in our synagogues, at our agencies, and, and we are so proud of the incredible work that, that the um, professionals in our community have done to kind of pivot over the last few weeks to bring and to still continue to build community, which is which is what we do and what the what the Jewish Federation and all of our agencies and synagogues have always done. Um, also, take a look at the website um, in the next couple of days to have some great opportunities to share Passover across the community and, and some resources. Um, our synagogues, uh, like I said, are doing an amazing job of of pivoting and, and making sure that um, there's lots of ways to connect during this time of social distancing when we're all trying to do our little part in this um, by staying home and, and trying to stay safe. Um, I also wanna let you know a little bit about the amazing work of our Jewish Family Services. Um, Lori Moss, who I'm sure all of you know, um, and her team have been working around the clock to try to meet the needs of the, of the most needy in our Jewish community. Um, they've had a, a pretty incredible increase um, in the needs that they are seeing through Popsy's Pantry, delivering food um, to those who can't leave their homes, taking people to uh, doctor's appointments who are um, on dialysis or receiving chemo. Um, they are working very hard for all of you. So please reach out if you or anyone you know needs assistance during this time. Um, we have a couple of social workers on hand who, um, uh, who have been working in the Jewish community for many, many years and they are here to help. Um, I also wanna let you know that we, um, that Popsy's Pantry is still needs um, household items. And if you are able um, or you come across them in the store and you wanna donate, um, we are still taking donations. You can just drop things off outside um, of, our, of our Jewish Family Services office on Hoover Road, and, um, and we will make sure that, that those items get to those in need. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues at Hooverwood, at our JCC, at Haston Hebrew Academy, and at JCRC, who are doing incredible <laughs> work all you know, on our behalf. Um, Hooverwood has been um, keeping its 170 plus residents safe and, and, and healthy and they're thriving. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen some of the videos that they've done online. Um, the JCC was asked by the city to open up the early childhood program, which they are working hard to make happen later this week um, to help medical, to help medical um, employees 
um, to watch their children. Um, and um, our JCRC is doing some incredible work um, in helping us get information about the CARES Act and some of the other um, legislation that is coming out of Washington. Um, and Haston Hebrew Academy and its teachers are doing some really incredible creative work. Um, I wanna take a quick moment to let you know the other very exciting news this week. Um, uh, starting today, um, the Indianapolis Jewish community has hired Grant Mendenhall um, as our regional security director for the In Secure Indy Initiative. Um, I hope you will all join us on Wednesday night um, to hear from our friends at Secure Community Network and from Grant um, about next steps with our Secure Indy um, Initiative. But Grant, if you could just say hi for a quick second and then we will um, move everything over to, uh, to Dr. Profeta and to Dr. Cantor. Hey, thanks again, Debbie, for the, another warm welcome. I really appreciate it. I see we got 194 people on now. That's awesome. Hey, I'm really, really excited and really humbled to be a part of this team. I wish I was starting on a day that was in a different environment. Uh, but as everybody else in the Federation is, I'm committed to moving forward um, under the current circumstances and, uh, and working with the team at, at uh, the Federation and in the broader community um, to make this security program happen. So I'm thrilled to be here, happy to be a part of the team, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as I can in the next several months, hopefully sooner rather than later. Thanks again. Thanks, Grant. More information about the program on Wednesday can be found um, on our website and on social media. Beth, back to you. Thanks, Debbie, and thank you, Grant, for that. Um, it's my uh, pleasure right now to introduce not one physician, but two physicians. We have a double bonus. We are joined tonight um, by not only Dr. Louis Profeta, but also by Dr. Rob Cantor. Uh, Dr. Cantor is a full-time emergency medicine doctor at the VA hospital and works part-time in the emergency room at the uh, Sydney and Lois Eskenazi Hospital. And Dr. Louis Profeta, um, has a, a long lengthy bio that, um, that includes um, not only being a, a nationally recognized award-winning writer um, and speaker, but um, head of emergency medicine at St. Vincent's uh, in Indianapolis. Um, he's also a, uh, an alumni of Indiana University uh, School of Medicine, and I'm proud to say is, I believe, a alumni of North Central High School and a fellow Panther. So um, to both Dr. Cantor and Dr. Profeta, we very much appreciate your time. I know it's very, very difficult, very stressful, but uh, again, please, we, please join us and we are just thrilled that you are here with us. Doctors? Thank you. Thank you. I think Dr. Profeta, we're gonna start maybe with you because I think Dr. Kanner is on for not too much longer, but um, I think we've got some questions um, that are going to be posed to you. Debbie, do you wanna start the questions off? Absolutely. Um, and, and really, you know, I think the first question, we'd love to hear from both of you about what you are seeing um, on the ground, um, you know, out in uh, both at the VA hospital and at St. Vincent's. Um, you know, how prepared are the hospitals to be dealing with what, um, what you are dealing with? And, um, you know, all we see is what's on the news. So um, if you can share a little bit with us on, on what, uh, what you're seeing on the ground. Well, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. You, you look at all the people out in the neighborhood walking and, you know, people in the community or people that are trying to stay home. And, you, you can almost get the sense that there's a peacefulness, a calmness outside of the hospital environment. And it really is sort of a, a really tough and strenuous time. It's, the, it's the, the, the most stress and the hardest environment I've ever worked in in over 25 years. And it's not because the volume is, is so high. In fact, the volume is probably a little lower than it normally is. It's just that the acuity and how sick these people are um, is really weighing on you. And then how you have to go about your day wearing N95 masks, protective goggles and gear, and then trying to have it to dictate and 
see these patients and be constantly cognizant of where your hands are and how clean you are and if you're touching surfaces. And it is the most exhausting I've ever, uh, uh, I've ever experienced in working in the emergency department. This is including, you know, major traumas and ice storms and influenza pandemics and H1N1. I've never uh, experienced anything like this. I think, Rob, you could probably attest to that too at the VA. Yeah, it's very similar. I, I agree with everything you said. Um, you know, most of us in emergency medicine pride ourselves in being able to prepare for the worst case scenario, prepare for the disaster. It's what we do. It's how we live. Um, this is completely outside the scope of anything any of us have seen. Um, there is certainly a tension in the hospital. Um, morale is low. Um, fear levels are high. Um, protective gear is limited, and um, we really know that it's going to get worse. We just don't know how bad it's going to get before it plateaus. Um, so it's it's day by day, and just hoping that we can can flatten the curve, prolong this out long enough uh, to either until a a vaccine is made, which is not going to be in the super near future, unfortunately, or until there's enough herd immunity from people that have already recovered from this, that the rest of the community is protected. But that's going to take some time also. You know, we, we talked, um, I think it was probably around 2013 or maybe 2012, uh, somewhere in that area. I. I actually testified in front of uh, Congress and m members of Senate and Susan Brooks and Donnelly and some other other politicians. And back then they wanted to know about our preparedness for an earthquake in the Midwest. Were we ready for an earthquake? And um, you know, I told them point blank back then, I said, I don't know why we're worried about an earthquake. We need to worry about pan flu. I mean, we need to worry about uh, a pan influenza epidemic, something similar to the Spanish flu in, in the turn of the century. Now, you know, it, it's interesting. Everybody says we were caught off guard by this. We're so surprised. There wasn't an ER doc in America that was surprised this was going to happen. I mean, we were just sort of hoping it would never happen during our lifetime, I think. But there wasn't any, any of us that thought that this was not going to happen. And I think Rob can attest it. In medicine, one of the problems that we've had for years is that we have just sort of always been operating at a, a just enough kind of level. We have just enough nurses, just enough doctors, just enough medications, just enough ventilators, just enough sedatives, that we always knew that if we had a, a major surge of this type, that we would be in trouble. And this has been going on for decades. This didn't just happen in the, in the last few months. This has been something that has been a problem in medicine for years. We are chronically under, under uh, in need of certain medications that we're not able to get uh, through manufacturers and, and on and on. So none of this really caught us off, off guard, but uh, I don't think either one of us have ever operated in this environment of fear that we have. I mean, and I sort of touched on this in some of my writing, and Rob can attest, is you get up in the morning and you go to work and you wonder, is today the last day that I'm going to be healthy? You know, is this the day that I get sick from one of my patients and then, you know, am I going to die from this? You know, uh, you know, I'm a little older than Rob. <laughs> I got, you know, some more risk factors. So, I mean, I, I stuff that I had never thought about, you know, um, you know, letting my wife know the passwords to account, talking to my finance guy, talking to, you know, different people. And every day it's, you know, think about trying to go to work with that fear. I mean, I love medicine. I love taking care of people. But. I didn't really think I was going to risk my life doing it. And uh, that's sort of how you feel. You're going to work every day with that weight on you. And I mean, Rob, I, I think you could probably attest. I mean, you're a new father. You got two you know, little kids at home. Yeah, that, that last breath of fresh air before you walk into the building means something now. It, it didn't used to before. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a whole different, whole different way of thinking, a whole different mindset. Um, and yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. Um, this is something that we should have been more prepared for, uh, than we were. 
So, so that actually, you know, leads me to, to one of the questions that I wanted to ask is why, why aren't we better, why weren't we better prepared um, for this, you know, for this to come in? And what are you both hearing from, um, from your respective hospitals about the protective gear and, and some of those shortages that we keep hearing about on, on the news? Is that going to make its way to Indianapolis and, and to, to our institutions? Right now, I, I mean, I don't know how it is with Rob at the VA or at Indiana University Health. I think we're, we're okay right now. I feel comfortable where we are at, at uh, Ascension Health at, at St. V's. We have enough masks. We have enough gowns. We have enough gloves. We've, we've mobilized the ICU. I mean, people like uh, John Samala, Tom Holian, Brandon Perkins, some of our ICU docs. We have been on this for weeks. For weeks and weeks, we have been preparing for this. Um, and I know that IU Health and Eskenazi Health has been doing uh, similar. You know, I, I, I gave an interview yesterday with Anne-Marie Tiernan at Channel 13, and one of the things I told her is, you guys, I, I hope you appreciate how far ahead of the curve Indiana is. I mean, we really are. Um, man, I could I could not be prouder than the the people of the state in what they have done. They have taken it more seriously than than a lot of states. So, um, you know, from that standpoint, I think that we're ahead of the game, but we're still in trouble. Okay, um, there there's a, a a lot of sick people, and they're they're pouring in. Um, we we're providing great care for them. Um, I'm sure Indiana University Health is too, St. Francis community. We talk to our colleagues, we share information and data. We know what works, what's not working. So I'm proud of the city right now, the response. Rob, what do, what do you think? What's your feeling about that? Well, I think one of the reasons that we were so underprepared is because no one alive uh, has experienced anything like this. Uh, like Dr. Exactly. Perfetta said, I think we all kind of assumed that it, when it happened, it would be maybe a few generations from now, maybe a few hundred years from now, who knows? Um, one of the scary things about this virus is that in the areas that are hit particularly hard, so look at New York, look at Florida, look at Washington, you see a doubling effect every roughly two to three days, sometimes only two days. So very quickly, you go from feeling like you're kind of on top of this and you've got enough supplies and you've got enough ventilators and you've got enough ICU beds and you've got enough nurses to within a week, you can become overrun. And, and that's what you're seeing with New York right now. I mean, they are just really, really frantic. Um, and I, I agree with Dr. Profeta, we are, we are ahead of other states. Um, I think there's, when I last checked, there were um, 16 or 17 states that had more cases than we did. Um, but we, um, uh, you know, at the VA, we are, really rationing our supplies, our protective gear as best as we can. I have one N95 mask, one pair of goggles. I put them into a brown paper bag at the end of my shift. Um, that's what I'm gonna wear for the next several shifts um, until my mask or goggles become useless, damaged, ruined, um, which just by breathing into it for that many of shifts is, is bound to happen. So. Um, we are rationing as best as we can because we realize that a week, two weeks, four weeks from now, we could be in a whole different situation than we are right now. You know, one, one, of, the, one of the things, and Rob, I don't have some experience this yet, but, you know, putting somebody on a ventilator is actually, it's a, it's a, um, it's a tough procedure. It takes a lot of skill, takes a lot of good hand-eye coordination, sort of calm nerves and stuff. Um, things that we normally used to do where we would bag people up, we would amboo them to get their oxygen level up, is actually uh, fairly risky now. Now we're aerosolizing virus and we're trying not to do that. And also because we've got to wear N95 masks, and we've got to wear face shields. You know, somebody like me and we can't get down and, and innovate them like we normally do. We're innovating them vis-a-vis -vis a camera uh, to try to decrease our exposure. It is a lot harder to, to do it. Your glasses are fogging up, your mask is fogging up, and your hand is covered with virus, and there's no way I'm gonna reach under my face shield and wipe my glasses clean when I'm completely uh, infected at that time. So if we can't get these people on a ventilator, they're gonna die. 
And it, it just, it contributes to that level of anxiety and that constant tension. And, um, you know, I just never thought I would, would experience something like that, but you know, we're, we're doing okay. We're, we're, we've got, uh, we're it's doing as best we can considering the situation. So it the is other, what it is. Yeah. And the other <laughs> issue is since we don't know who has this virus and who doesn't yet. So somebody comes in and they might need a mask to help them breathe that, that pressure, what we call BiPAP uh, or CPAP uh, or a non rebreather or high flow nasal cannula. Some of these things that we, that we're used to doing, we may have a patient where that may actually make them better and prevent an intubation or prevent a more aggressive procedure. But since we don't know, and since we can't take the chance that they may have it, we're withholding yeah. potentially life-saving treatments for people that may otherwise be appropriate for them. We don't know. Um, I mean, there's some more rapid tests coming out. Uh, it seems like every week now, which is great, but you know, we've got seconds to make some of these decisions. And we may, in some cases, be withholding some therapies for patients that do not have coronavirus. But there's no way for us to know and coronavirus can present with the exact same symptoms that we're seeing. So we are making, you know, our best guess um, and all the while trying to preserve the healthcare workers, uh, not just the doctors, but the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the technicians, um, the environmental management people that clean the room afterwards. I mean, you know, if, if that group gets sick, the rest of the community gets We're done. done. So, we're done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 if we lose our nurses and our doctors, um, and, you know, thank God it, it isn't happening that much. We're, eight, we're, we're doing okay. But if they start dropping, I, mean, I don't know what we're going to do. Um, I, I don't know what we're going to do. But, you know, right now we're staying healthy. We're, we're, um, we're, we're where we need to be or less best case scenario for us. But I mean, I look at New York and I, and I get the emails and texts from my, my friends in other, other cities. And I mean, it, it's scary, but um, you know, we, we need to keep, have people. And, and again, that sort of goes back to that notion. You look outside and everything sort of looks good outside because there isn't a lot of chaos out in the world in terms of just looking out your window. But man, come look in our window. It, it's um, a whole different world. And um, Anything that people can do in the community to keep out of our emergency department is going to make the environment that much better. But it's still, you, you get people coming in, you know, I don't want to say for stupid things, but things that they have no business coming in right now for. Yeah. Um, We're seeing a lot of questions um, come up. So I, I want to I wanna ask a couple of them that I've seen pop up while, while you both were talking. Um, can you tell us... Um, First of all, how long does it take someone to recover from this? Are you seeing people come in that have tested positive, that aren't going on a ventilator and are responding to other therapies? Are you encouraging people who are feeling like they may be experiencing some of these symptoms to stay home until what point should they be coming into the ER? That's a great question. Um, great question. It, well, realize the ones we're seeing are sick. So we don't really have the benefit of seeing the ones that have recovered. You know, hopefully they're not stepping foot back in our ER. But I will tell you, we're sending plenty of people home that come back critically ill 48 hours later. But there's no way we can be admitting all those people. We would be completely overrun. So if they're not requiring oxygen, and I imagine you guys are doing the same thing at the VA, Rob, if they're, or at Eskenazi, if they're not requiring oxygen, and they're breathing okay, and they just have fevers or typical flu symptoms, we send them home, tell them to self-quarantine, and if they get worse, we tell them to come back in, meaning, and primarily what, we, what we're typically thinking of is people that are having trouble breathing, trouble keeping anything down by mouth, then those are the ones we need to see back. But if you're just talking about fever, body aches, chills, cough, headache, and you're breathing okay, stay at home, okay? And, and another thing that I would encourage, and this sort of sounds morbid, but you have to talk with your elderly family members about if they want to be on life support, okay? 
And you have to have that discussion with them because you're not going to be able to come in with them when they present to the emergency department. And in most instances, they're going to be short of breath, maybe not be able to give us a story, and we're going to put, have to put them on life support. And we, we don't want to do that if their wishes are to, to die in peace. And we will keep them comfortable. But if there's one thing that we would beg of you to do, especially with your family members that are in nursing homes or have Alzheimer's or have these discussions, and if those are their wishes, you don't have to bring them in. We can provide hospice care at home and comfort care at home too and in the nursing homes for these patients. But man, you've got to have those discussions. I mean, what do you think, Rob? I agree, uh, super important. Um, most patients that come in short of breath can't tell us what the questions that we're, that we're asking. Uh, a lot of times they're confused. Um, so even if they can speak, they're not answering our questions. And then, you know, we don't know what to do. Uh, when we don't know, we do everything. Um, so is, is that what's always best? Absolutely not. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really, really good point, Lewis. Um, in terms of how long it takes to recover, the short answer is somewhere between five and 14 days. Um, mild symptoms, um, mild illness seems to resolve fairly quickly. Um, for patients that are sicker or that need to be admitted to the hospital, um, you're looking at probably two weeks unless they're intubated and, and develop complications and then obviously longer. The problem is that even once you recover, you could still be shedding the virus. So just because your symptoms have resolved doesn't mean you're no longer contagious. Um, you, know, you may not be coughing as much, which is great, but you could still shed the particle on your hand. There's a lot of fecal oral transmission. So, so far, the last time I checked, um, zero patients in Indiana have gotten this virus, recovered, and been deemed safe to go about their business, go back to work, um, shake people's hands. I don't think anyone has actually been declared safe for that yet, even if their symptoms have resolved. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Profeta, we'll make sure to um, share the link to uh, to your LinkedIn articles. Um, that that one that you wrote recently about talking to your elderly parents was really powerful. So I'll make sure that we get that out to the community for anybody who hasn't read it. And thank you, thank you for that. Um, I want to open things up to uh, questions from um, our participants. Jeff, can you help us do that? I can. Um... Give me just a moment here. Yeah, I do have to give a shout out to Nada and Ben in, in LA. Um, great friends of ours as the Farda community out there in Los Angeles who have uh, uh, been invaluable in offering prayers from their community for our, our people here. So Ben and Nada, if you're out there, thank you. Uh, so Tibor, are you on the call? Uh, I am, yes. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, wondered whether uh, either of you doctors had a uh, projection or maybe a guesstimate as to when the infection might peak here in the central Indiana area. Just sort of timeline information. Well, I hope it was today. <laughs> um, Rob, I mean, I've heard anywhere from this week to two weeks to I don't know. I don't know. I don't either. It's, no, a, it's a great question, and I wish I had an answer. Right. Um, Thank you, Tibor. Um, I just saw a question pop up. Is it worthwhile for the rest of us to be wearing masks when we're out in public, or is that um, not not a good use so, of, of PPE? It's one less mask for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the evidence shows that these yeah. surgical masks. I've got one just so I, I know what we're talking about here. These masks, as, as I assume what you're talking about, or the N95s. Um, yeah. You know, the N95s, um, please donate to the nearest hospital. Yes. Um, they're the ones that need them. Um, they mm -hmm. are really only designed to help people in very close proximity to uh, patients this, that this are- This is an N95. Thank you, yes. Mm -hmm. That's an N95. You, you cannot make those. You can see it. It sort of says N95 on it. 3M. Right. 
I saw a question earlier if, if uh, the community could be making masks. Um, you can make things equivalent to this. You cannot make those N95s by going to, you know, your local Joanne Fabrics. Um, it, it's just not possible. Those filter out, you know, 95% of all particles. They're, they're micron, super small holes. Um, but for either, you know, if you have the N95s, please donate them. These surgical masks, they tend not to keep healthy people um, healthy, meaning they don't, they don't do a great job at filtering out any particles in the air and preventing a healthy person from becoming infected. They're really more designed to help a sick person not shed the particles out into the air by coughing. I think that one of the things they do, though, Rob, is that they do make you cognizant of touching your face. In That's your right. nose, especially out in public. If you put your hand on the door to Costco, right. you can easily transmit that to your nasopharynx. And that's probably the primary mode of transmission. So if anything, what it does do is make you cognizant of touching your, your nose and your mouth and your face. If, if everyone listening can do really just a few simple steps, you can dramatically decrease your chance of getting this infection. Number one is wash your hands. I mean, wash your hands after every door after every elevator button, um, just get in the habit of doing it. Um, whether it's soap and water, which works, whether it's Purell, um, it doesn't matter. Clean your hands. Um, the other thing is that we just have to get into the frame of mind of avoiding touching our faces. It's hard. People wear glasses. People uh, have beards. People have, you know, their nose itches. It is, we have just got to train ourselves to stop touching our faces. Um, that is absolutely the number one mode of transmission is hand to face. It's not people coughing and then you walking through that space, um, although that can happen in the hospital setting yep. or if someone's close to you that's ill. Um, number one by far is your own hand to your own face. So we, we got it it's as a community and I'm just as guilty as, as everyone else. And I, I, I'm trying to train myself too. Um, stop touching stop touching our faces. It's hard. It's really hard. Yep. David, uh, David Glenn, uh, David Glenn, I've got you unmuted. I think you've asked a great question that's on a lot of our minds, but certainly uh, first responders, please. David, you there? I'll go ahead and ask David's question for him. Um, he asked, how are you self-caring to be prepared to go back to work each day? Your mental health is very important to your own health, as well as the health of the people around you. And, you know, I, I have been blessed. I have a wonderful wife and wonderful boys. Um, they're all here with me. They're all supporting me. Um, you know, trying to exercise. <laughs> I'm not doing a very good job. Um, just trying to, tr trying to relax, trying to, to laugh watching TV, uh, trying to find downtime, you know, realizing every day is special, but it's hard. Yeah, but the Jewish community especially has been unbelievably supportive. You know, it, a day doesn't go by where my inbox, you know, or Facebook or what have you isn't filled with people thanking me for, for helping them and, or for being there. And that certainly helps, you know, they're sending pizzas and, you know, food to the ER and, um, I mean, all that goes a long way. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cantor, can you tell us a little bit about how we can help um, out at the VA also? I know the Jewish community has been very supportive of um, the work at St. Vincent because uh, it's kind of in our backyard. But um, if we can do anything as a community to help um, your ER, we would be happy to do that. Thank you for asking. Um, nurses and doctors love food. Um, especially free food. Um, I know I've seen Dr. Profeta has posted uh, on Facebook that, uh, you know, the community has been great and has, has donated and dropped off food to the ER. Um, that is uh, one of the best ways that you can support us um, uh, directly is, is, is that, or if you have N95s or you have other protective gear that you think that we might be able to use, um, that would be wonderful. Um, and beyond that, um, stay home and just let us know that you guys are all following the recommendations. Um, you know, the fewer people that we see in the ER right now, the better. 
Um, uh, it seems like most of the community is listening. Like, like Lewis said, our volumes seem to be down overall uh, for the moment. We don't know when that will change, um, but free food is, is I'll give, I'll give two thumbs up for, for free food. Um, someone, you know, just, someone just asked when, um, when we should, when someone should go get tested. I wish, I wish everyone could get tested today. I mean, yeah. when? Um, now. Um, we don't have enough tests is the problem. Um, there doesn't seem to be enough pressure from the federal government to get these, these tests out. Um, but that's really what we need. Um, a lot of people have heard about the Lilly drive through testing. You need a physician um, order to do that or a provider order. Um, you can't just show up. They, they, they call you, they schedule an appointment time. Um, and so if you can get a physician to, to write the order, then I guess you could get that test and that's usually back within 24 to 48 hours. Um, but don't show up don't at our ER. ER. To do be not tested. Any ER. Yeah, yeah, do not do that. Okay. If you're not sick, we're not going to test don't you. Come. And we're going to send you home. We're going to kick you out, and all you're going to do is expose yourself to illness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great advice. But you know, prayer is still a good thing, right? I mean, we are a Jewish community, and prayer is still important. I think Hashem hopefully listens to you guys. So anything you could throw his way, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. It looks like Marissa Zuckerman has a question. Jeff, can you unmute her, please? Do you see Marissa? Jeff, you're muted. Um, so I just saw one question, um, which was about um, the um, it said that the fabric masks that those are being used um, and worn by like the you know aides at some of our nursing homes and things like that. Um, so I, I I just wanted to put that out there. I know there's a group of people, the mitzvah stitchers that have been that have been knitting um, and and sewing some masks and giving them to healthcare workers and aid workers, which is I think very different than what you were talking about, um, you know, in, in relationship to those of you who are on the front lines and on the ground. Um, um, I did see a question about um, what we saw in China and Italy and um, if we should be looking at those countries to kind of guide what we should be looking for over the next two months or so. Is that something that you both are doing? You mean like China, like locking up people that speak out or, or uh, lying about the number of people that are dead or <laughs> are you talking about that kind of stuff? No, we probably shouldn't be doing that, Deb. <laughs> um, I don't know what, 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 what we would... It was what, more in, in the question was more about the time frame and, you know, <laughs> things seem to peak there and then sort of flatten out. Um, I, 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 I would not... Saying. I would not take anything that China tells us in regards to this illness uh, for face value. And I'm dead serious about that. Um, I, you know, we can look at Italy and we can see what they have been going through and we can try to learn from them. Um, I think we're, we're learning more with just what's going on in New York and Jersey and uh, in, you know, New Orleans uh, to really get a good idea about where we're headed. Um, you know, it, Italy was woefully underprepared. Their mortality rate, I think, is, is uh, much higher than what we are experiencing in terms of the cases that we have. So uh, I think that they have a lot to learn from us, and I think we need to keep doing what we're doing. I'm seeing a lot of questions about um, things that people can do at home, about using vinegar to clean, about taking vitamin D or vitamin C, if there's anything that, you know, is helpful like that. Um, I know, uh, Dr. Panter, you talked about washing your hands. Um, I saw somebody just posted about gargling mouthwash. I mean, are there some um, simple things that we can be doing at home like that? Um, or is it all just uh, kind of a... I don't know if there, I don't know, Rob, I don't know if there's any data out there either way. I mean, it'll make your breath smell mini fresh. I don't think anything's wrong with that. Um, anything that allows you to be more hygienic is good. 
Um, but I don't know if any of the vitamins help. I don't know. Rob, what, what is your opinion on that? I'll put it this way. If you're washing your hands constantly and if you're avoiding touching your face, you can do whatever else you want. I don't think there's a lot of evidence that, that vitamin C or vitamin D or zinc or vinegar or mouthwash or any of, the other, of, the, of these other home remedies are going to do anything. They are certainly not going to do more than the first two. Um, and I would add, and on top of the first two, if you're sick, don't go around anybody else. Just don't. Uh, and if you're a, if you see someone who's sick, don't go around them. Um, if it's a family member, you know, to, to answer the question earlier, if I get sick, um, I am going to probably find a hotel somewhere and just live there for two weeks. Um, I can't find a hotel. Isolating I'll, I'll, while you're at home is also important. If you start to see some symptoms from the correct. other people in your home. I mean, do your best. I know it's hard. We all have families. Um, pets seem to be immune to this, so you can hug your dog. That's fine. <laughs> um, but we have to do as much as we can. You know, it, the, the truth of the matter is, if someone gets this virus and brings it home, they're probably going to end up spreading it to everyone else in their family. I mean, there is probably very little to avoid that unless you and they probably will have already spread it by the time they exhibited right. symptoms and i'm sure right. that everybody a lot of your your listeners are wanting to know about chloroquine um you know that that there's the data is all over the place with it um we are not writing prescriptions for chloroquine and don't ask your doctors to do it to the pharmacist are asking people not to do it. We cannot be hoarding uh, chloroquine. There's already a limited amount of that. The stuff that we are given are typically people in the intensive care unit in combination with IV Zithromax. And we're now, um, a lot of these places are out of Zithromax. And, you know, we need those, we need those drugs where that, where they are. Um, you know, does it work? I don't know. The data isn't really there yet. Most of the studies out of France uh, are really not that convincing. And these drugs are not without side effects. They can cause what we call QT prolongation, cardiac arrest. Um, they are not just a panacea that, oh, hey, you know, let's just throw some people on anti-malarial drugs. Um, they do interact with a lot of other drugs out there. Um, so we, we, there are multi-center studies right now looking about it prophylaxis of, of chloroquine for healthcare providers and whether these, these drugs work, but the data isn't there yet. So, um, you know, we're not writing it. Typically the ICU are putting people in, on ventilators on chloroquine with Zithromax combination therapies and some other therapies. Um, we don't know if the antivirals really work or not. Again, the, the data is not there and you don't just throw medicines at people to see if they'll stick. This is the problem with viruses. Yeah, yeah. This is the problem with viruses. We don't have a, a, a cure for this virus. Um, we don't have a vaccine yet. Um, when we do, things will change, hopefully. Um, I'm seeing a couple of questions about um, debunking some of the myths out there. Is ibuprofen bad? Uh, you know, what are some of the other things like that that, we're, that we've heard, you know, cause more problems than good? Well, at the beginning, they were discussing whether that ibuprofen, your non might be bad, but now the data actually shows that you're okay taking um, ibuprofen and Tylenol out there. Is that your understanding, Rob? It is, yeah. Um, they've, they've looked at ibuprofen with other coronaviruses in the past. Um, the, the best one, I think, was in like 2013 yeah. or something and showed that there wasn't the, there did not seem to be a trend towards harm with ibuprofen when compared with Tylenol and some other medications. Mm -hmm. So I think ibuprofen's safe. If I get a fever um, or I'm in pain from this coronavirus, I'll probably take ibuprofen. Yeah. It seems to work better at fever and pain uh, I agree. than Tylenol. So I, I plan to take it. Mm -hmm. We're getting lots of questions about the um, issue of Indianapolis being a hot spot and how that came up yesterday. Can either one of you comment on that? I mean, I work today and I'll tell you, I think it's a hot spot. <laughs> um, I, I don't even know what the definition of a hot spot. If you're talking about uh, increasing cases and, and um, a lot of people ill, yeah, it probably is. But you show me a state right now, other than maybe rural Wyoming that isn't. 
Um, I think everybody's headed that way. I'd rather be here than New York. It's, it's in every community. Um, if you have friends or family in a community that hasn't seen this yet, um, it's there. It's there. Um, this is every community has this virus now. Yes. Uh, Martha, Martha Carrots, uh, you're on. Hi, good evening. Thank you for doing this. I have a question about the immunity blood tests and uh, testing for one's immunity via, you know, a blood draw. And is that going to become available, encouraged? How do you get it? What's the wisdom of getting it? Um, but hear about communities and some uh, areas that are supporting this, you know, finding out if you already have the immunity. Are you talking about uh, somebody that's already developed the anti antibodies yes. to it? Correct. Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, I mean, we're not testing for it. I, I don't, you know, I, what, they, what they are really talking about in regards to antibodies is the question is, can you isolate people's antibodies uh, through uh, sort of what we call plasmapheresis or something similar, where you can harvest their antibodies and then infuse them into somebody else that has COVID and possibly those antibodies can, can work to, um, to treat somebody who's critically ill uh, with COVID-19. I'll have to be honest, I don't know what the data is in terms of that. I have heard that it, it's being tried um, or studied, but yeah, I mean, it, there, there is some, uh, it makes some sense that it might have some benefit, but that's, that's, I think, where you're talking about if you're checking to see if people have antibodies to it. I mean, we, we do um, antibody testing for other other viruses. Uh, the, the most common one would be like hepatitis, where we'll do antibody testing to see if you've mounted immune response to the hepatitis vaccine or people that have mumps or uh, women that are trying to get pregnant or, you know, it, with chicken pox and stuff like that, if you have antibodies to that. But right now, I don't see any real, you know, utility in, a, in it, other than maybe some people's own peace of mind that maybe they, they can say, oh, I got antibodies to it. Now I can go doing this you know, I can, you know, work in this environment or something. Paula Fogel asked an interesting question. Um, actually, Grant, um, if you wouldn't mind uh, utilizing your prior uh, security uh, knowledge um, in your former work, uh, there was a question regarding hate groups that are blaming uh, Jews, the Jewish community for the virus. Can you talk a little bit, Grant, about how, how these things are monitored by law enforcement at the um, local, state, and federal levels? Yeah, that's a great, great topic that we could talk about all night, probably. Um, there's, there's one thing to keep in mind with any kind of hate speech, and this is a just a probably the newest form of, of hate speech that none of us have really heard before, because we haven't been through a, a pandemic like this before. But what the law enforcement community is monitoring and looking for is violations of federal law or state law. Um, it's not, you've heard this before from, from many people, it's not against the law to hate people. Um, it is against the law to, to turn, turn that hatred into action and, and uh, violate state or federal laws. Um, so that's, again, this is, um, it's a new form of, of spreading hate, uh, but the, the dynamics of what constitutes a crime and what constitutes an offense that law enforcement actually take action against is no different than any other type of hate speech. Thank you, Grant. Jeff, do you see some more questions? I see a couple uh, well, of questions about, sorry, Jeff, about um, donating blood and the safety of donating blood. If, uh, if you guys could comment on that, please. It's interesting that you bring that up. In fact, we are trying to set up a blood drive in our neighborhood. Um, we're, we're hoping to get a bus, uh, get the, uh, or the blood mobile to come to our neighborhood. Um, the Red Cross and the blood banks are desperate need of blood right now because people aren't even going out to donate blood. So um, it, yes, it's safe to donate blood. And if you're healthy and you're able-bodied, I'd encourage you to call your local um, uh, blood bank, if you're able to, and get out. They can they can safely draw it. They'll they'll um, the protections are in place. Um, social distancing, hopefully, and everything. So, yeah, if you can donate blood, we need it. I mean, I, we used a bunch today. 
You know what, well, we will work on that. Maybe that's something we can uh, do on the campus without anybody coming into the building. And uh, that, that's a great suggestion. Um, Rob, I think is answering some questions that people are asking by text. Um, I think the two of you need to go on the road um, with this. It's, uh, it's really been wonderful. Jeff, do you wanna open it up for a couple more questions? We've got about 10 minutes uh, left. Um, let me just go ahead and just ask uh, one of the questions. Does the VA have a different supply system um, that would be different from non-VA uh, hospitals? Let me just piggyback on that, which is, you know, where are you both seeing um, the most um, COVID cases um, across, you know, the Indianapolis region? Is there, um, it, you know, is there a, an area or a neighborhood where we're seeing more cases come come through, or is it just kind of all over the place? It's everywhere. Yeah. I haven't noticed a difference. Have you, Rob? I mean, I'm on the north side, so most of my my patients are coming from the north side, so. No, it, it, it's everywhere. Um, I, I mean, not, not to scare people, but it is <laughs> likely in your neighborhood, um, in your community, wherever you are living. All our rural hospitals, uh, you know, we have out, we have, you know, satellite hospitals out everywhere from Henry County to, you know, Mercy to, to Scottsburg to, you know, and they're all seeing it. It's everywhere. So one of the questions that, that just popped up is, if you've been in social isolation for the last three weeks, is there a chance, I mean, does that mean that you've passed this? Or if you go back out now, you could now pick it up? That's a great question. No, no I mean, it, it could be that you're lucky enough not to have had it, but you go back out, you, you expose yourself every single time you step out that door. I don't have a good answer about when it's going to be safe to go back out in the community. I just don't know. You know, I have el older parents too, over 80. I haven't visited them. I mean, I'm a pretty high risk exposure. Rob is too. Um, you know, we want to help our, our elderly family members. The best way to do it is just have food delivered to them. If they can, if they're able bodied, uh, I wouldn't go out right now. You know, I had uh, a relative that called and said, hey, can I, can I buy so-and-so a mask so he or she could go to Costco? And I said, you're out of your mind <laughs> to let them go out at that age right now. So if we can do something, especially for those at-risk people, people with underlying heart disease, uh, lung disease, um, um, immunocompromised patients, transplant cancer patients, that kind of stuff, those people have no business being out in public right now. I guess that's a, a good spot for me to just mention again that um, that Hooverwood has um, some meals that they are delivering to people who are homebound and, and, and at risk for going out. Our Jewish Family Service is doing great work with um, members of our Jewish community to help identify people who need extra help and, and um, you know, the, we're here and we want to help. Um, we're making phone calls to somewhere around 5,000 um, community members. We've got about 50 people who have volunteered to make calls just to check in and see how people are doing. Um, if you are available or interested in helping to make calls, you can go to our um, Connect With uh, Care site on the Federation's website and there's a link there to sign up to, to help volunteer. And I'd, I'd like to chime in on that with Debbie that um, Hooverwood is having a blood drive tomorrow, I believe, at 2 p.m. Um, That's great. Yeah. So uh, everyone's Perfect. encouraged. Great. Stacey Siegel. See, we're already ahead of the curve. Yes. Jeff, you want to ask another couple questions? Um, actually, I think we should probably take a moment, uh, since we're in the last couple of minutes here, just to reiterate uh, Wednesday evening's program. Um, Andrea, are you able to uh, pull that up and share um, on the screen the information for Wednesday evening? So as Grant mentioned and Jeff mentioned, we've launched a Safe Indie initiative. Um, now that we have uh, Grant Mendenhall on our team, um, he is ready to jump in with both feet. Um, after he finishes his onboarding. And Wednesday night will be another opportunity for us to all come together to hear from Grant, 
from Secure Community Network. I think Mark Jardina is on this call from SCN. Um, and we are very much looking forward to having you all join us to learn more about um, this community-wide initiative. Um, our synagogues and our agencies all come together to partner on this program. Um, and again, you know, collaborating with each other is the most important thing that we can all be doing right now. Hey, Debbie, can I chime in on Wednesday real quick? Please, absolutely. Yeah, I'd just like to add, in addition to, to uh, Jeff and, and myself and Mark Jardina from Secure Community Network, we will also have a couple of security directors from other federations around the country who have been in the business for a while who will give some insights into what's happening in other federations and kind of give you a better idea of the direction we're going um, here with our federation. So there will be some very valuable information discussed on Wednesday. Perfect. Great. Thanks, Grant, for that. Um, I think it's about 827 and uh, I think we're gonna um, wrap up our question period. We wanna say thank you, a heartfelt thank you to Dr. Lewis Profeta, Dr. Rob Cantor. You guys are doing God's work. We cannot be more proud of you as representatives of the Jewish community and our heartfelt thanks for everything that you were doing and putting yourself at risk and taking care of our community. Um, Can I just interject with one thing real quick, just because someone uh, mentioned it. I know Passover is coming up. Um, I do not recommend any group seders. I'm so sorry. This is this is not what people want to hear. I agree. Um, try to do a virtual seder. Um, figure out some creative, fun way to be the people that you love without being there in person. Nobody should be getting together for group seder this year. It, it just it should not happen. Yeah, we wandered for 40 wrong. years in the wilderness. We can tolerate one Passover That's by right. ourselves. <laughs> That's absolutely right. And, you know, if we can help anyone in the community um, in setting up a Zoom for your families to be able to come together and connect, please reach out to us. Um, you can email the Federation at info at jfgi.org, and we'll get back with you. Zoom right now, which is the technology we're using tonight, um, allows people to set up a free account right now in order to connect with people. Um, we know how important it is, especially over Shabbat and over Passover, to be connecting with family. And we want to encourage all of you to do that safely and from your own homes. And uh, we'll have lots of resources on how to make it fun um, and engaging and safe. Thank Dr. you for everything that you guys are doing. Thank you, thank you, thank you you're so welcome. much. I, you're I hope welcome. you're seeing all these comments of everybody thanking you for all of your work and for sharing so much with us tonight. You're welcome. You're welcome. Stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you, you too. Stay everybody. healthy. All right. Bye. Thank you. Give give our best to your families. Good deal. Bye, LA. <laughs>